<laughs> Watch me forget to click go live. All right. So today we're going to talk, uh, we're going to start off, things off with a parable called the tortoise. One day, a wise sage was fishing when a prince paid him a visit to offer him the illustrious position of Supreme Chancellor. Without turning around, the sage said, I heard that there is a most sacred tortoise which has been dead for almost 3,000 years. The king keeps this tortoise packed up in a beautifully crafted box on the altar in his ancestral shrine. Now, he continued, do you think that tortoise would rather be dead and have its remains honored like this or be alive and wagging its tail in the mud? The prince answered that, of course, it would rather be alive and wagging its tail in the mud. To which the wise sage replied, well, then leave me, for I, too, prefer to remain here free, unbound and independent, wagging my tail in the mud. Damn the man, save the empire. Let's get into it today. What's up? Welcome to the Crypto Mining Show, your one-stop shop for all cryptocurrency news from the perspective of a cryptocurrency miner. My online persona is Blind Run. That's my gamer tag from all the way back to Counter-Strike 1.6, probably somewhere around there when Steam first launched. Today, we have all the fun topics. It looks like I accidentally am missing a couple, but we are going to be talking about the Ethereum merge today. We're going to get a summary up because later in the day, there will be the Ethereum all core devs meeting in which we should get more details surrounding the exact timing for the merge delay and see how much more time they have decided to give us peasants to go ahead and mine their currency or their security. <laughs> Other than that, we have something to talk about that, you know, is a little outside of crypto, but we're going to we're going to wrap it back around. We have a disinformation bureau in the United States now. And look, we got to talk about it. Elon Musk wants to authenticate every Twitter user. How do you guys feel about that? And how to build a decentralized Twitter. We're going to start off with that. After all that is done and through, we will be discussing, of course, mining profitability for the day and getting into questions and answers. Let's get into it right after a word from today's sponsor. Today's sponsor is myself. To support the channel, click the join button below the video and you will get access to our privately hosted Later today Rocket will Chat. Be after Selecting I go the $1.99 option will get you access. It. And after that, you need to head over to the membership tab, scroll down and expand out your membership perks. Find the section for connecting on Unless social you guys media. Think we watch and in the that whole section, there will be a secret registration show, URL I don't think to join wants. Rocket Chat, where you can sign up to enjoy talking with other cryptocurrency enthusiasts and miners without spammers, scammers, or bots. Boom. So, to address that, since we were talking over the ad there, basically that's the best ad that we got running right now. Uh, as far as the All Core Devs meeting goes, Typically what I do is take that, disseminate that down into what we need to know as proof of work miners and then get that information out. So that will be coming out later today on this channel, which will be preferably a less than 10 minute long video giving you the exact information that you need. That being said, let's go ahead and jump into today's first topic, how to build a decentralized Twitter. Is it even possible? Crypto based social media will be shaped by ex existing statutes, regulations, and norms, and may be limited by its tech. Tesla CEO Elon Musk's bid to acquire Twitter has resurrected longstanding discussion in the cryptoverse regarding at least to date a largely, largely theoretical product category, decentralized social media. Just as Bitcoin is censorship resistant money, the theory goes so too. Can we use Bitcoin-like infrastructure to run censorship-resistant social media applications while creating a social media app is trivially, tri trivially easy? Running a successful social media business is extraordinarily hard. I should know, back in 2014, Casey... 
Tyler and I proposed a DAO, a decentralized autonomous organization called Eris. That was basically a distributed version of Reddit that could run on a blockchain, Ethereum POC3 to be precise. That project failed for a number of reasons, not least because in 2014, the market couldn't tell the difference between a smart contract and a Pop-Tart, as most decentralized social media projects have and will. The problems with attempts to decentralize Facebook are both technological and legal. For one, decentralized applications rarely scale. Facebook generates over four petabytes of data per day. That is simply too much information for any serious number of nodes to bother mirroring. Even federated platforms like Mastodon, which ride the line between decentralized Bitcoin and centralized Facebook, run into bottlenecks. Uh, that problem I like to also pinpoint to, which we need to solve, is also going to be surrounding all of Web3, not just decentralized social media networks. And the problem really comes down to needing to solve persistent storage. We've harped on that quite a bit, but... Blockchains solve the problem of censorship at the edges, but are likely too overbuilt and redundant to manage massive global communications platforms. Likewise, it's essential to be able to delete posts from the inane to the hot-headed from platforms like Twitter. Where things get really messy, however, is where technology intersects with the law. Decentralized social media is likely possible, but the form it takes will be shaped by existing statutes, regulations, and norms. Social media companies, as it turns out, are subject to be uh, to a bevy of regulations. These rules govern the destruction and reporting of illegal content, copyright issues, data protection, and mandatory disclosure of sub subscriber records, among other things. They also vary by country by country. All these factors need to be accounted for in a decentralized social media applications design. Now, I would posture that this goes away. All of these problems go away because the nation state dissolves in the wake of the realization of cryptocurrency and its power surrounding it. Now, this comes obviously from the recent book that I've been harping on, The Sovereign Individual, where it discussed discusses the dissolution of, of course, nation states because there are too many people and people will start governing themselves thanks to the digital age that we are experiencing now and that transformation into it. And people will be able to set up their own sets of rules and govern themselves through technologies like Bitcoin. We talked about this a little bit on my Twitter yesterday. So if you're interested, you can head on over there. But the basic idea is you could use improvement proposal standards that we already have in place when we see changes to things like Bitcoin to basically have a blockchain self-governance. And that could happen in the long run as we transform into this digital age. And I think this problem by and large becomes less and less relevant. But of course we want to keep people safe too, right? That's always gonna be one of the arguments. One obstacle for decentralized applications is the problem of unlawful material. In the United States and across the world, the most uniformly illegal content is, of course, child sexual abuse material or CSAM. Remember, boys and girls, this is not a show for children, as it is referred to by law enforcement. Despite the fact that penalties for knowingly hosting this material are extreme, ranging from heavy fines to lengthy terms of imprisonment, the crypto industry's response to this very long-standing internet problem has more or less been to completely ignore it. Here's the other thing you have to take into account here, though. Just because we have these regulations, and this goes obviously into traditional arguments surrounding illegal activity across the board, whether it be drugs, guns, etc. No matter how many laws you put into place, you cannot control 7 billion people on the planet simultaneously and chase them down. And this is the problem that you have even with the worst of illegal content. Just because we have centralized data centers, etc., doesn't mean that this content isn't being illegally distributed online as it stands. So to use the argument against the technology purely based 
on this would be, I think, kind of a moot point. It's like, well, it's already being done. We just, it'd just be being done in a different manner and you'd have to figure out what to do there. Obviously, the public by and large would oppose this sort of activity. So if you allow the public to self-govern the blockchain, this could be prevented in a number of different ways. Reddit, Twitter, and Facebook, which host user content, take a proactive approach to eliminating this type of illegal material. Federal law requires electronic communication service providers, likely including both blockchain node operators as well as traditional centralized service providers to remove CSAM on discovery, securely preserve it for 90 days and then destroy it. Overseas where there is no such thing as the first amendment, even broader categories of unlawful content exist. See for example, the German blah, 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 or Nets DG, <laughs> which requires the uh, operators of social media services to register with the government after reaching a certain scale to abide by takedown requests. Now, this is coming to the United States today. We're going to be talking about it because this entire episode is going to be pretty much other than the Ethereum portion at the end of this surrounding this idea of utilizing the blockchain to self-govern and to basically open up freedom for the individual and give that sovereignty back to the individual. What we are going to hear today is essentially a ton of arguments against this sort of idea. But in my humble opinion, it's inevitable during this transformation. All right. So the French law number 2020 766 against hate content on the internet, which imposes fines for failing to remove unlawful content, including terrorist content within one hour of posting or section five of the defamation act 2013 in the United Kingdom, which has notice and takedown procedure for alleged defamation similar to the US, US DMCA where services like Reddit and Facebook are very responsive to all the above requests and requirements. Blockchain-based services like Storage or Psy, to my knowledge, have no such controls. They permit the storage of encrypted data without the creation of a subscriber record or the means of the service provider, in this case, the node operator, to ascertain what data is being stored. And that is how it should be. We should never cave to the fear of illegal activity to give up our privacy and our security. It is probable, and I would suggest even likely, that decentralized data storage services are currently being used to host unlawful content, likely without the knowledge of node operator hosting it. This level of willful blissness will be a complete non-starter for a decentralized social media app, which must be designed in such a way that an otherwise law-abiding user can participate in the network while being secure in the knowledge he or she is not viol violating local law. Once again, this is, everybody wants to think about the transformation we're going through into this digital blockchain age from an antiquated perspective where we have a governing body that tells us what's okay and what's not okay. You can build tools that allow the users to identify such content and remove it. And like I said, I do believe in the majority being overall good from this perspective. Now, I know a lot of people might disagree with me on that perspective, but I don't think that just because there is a law that it prevents the majority from participating in something completely heinous. I think that in general, humans strive to do good and improve. And I think that we can govern ourselves in this sort of ecosystem. And I do not accept that we have to abide by the old guard to basically have a successful society in the future. I don't think that that's necessary at, at all, especially if we look at any other age from the industrial age all the way back to the agricultural age and the transformations we saw take place then that are not dissimilar from what's going on now, other than of course the time of which it's taking to complete, meaning it's moving a lot quicker at this point. 
So far, no blockchain solution with a storage component even attempts to address this issue. It must be for nobody will run a node for a decentralized service if doing so risks imprisonment. At some point, I actually think that that will be kind of impossible, right? Because we already see, you know, in a lot of different places, just mining in general being made illegal. I think eventually, you know, China will start block, trying to block nodes. But at the same time, how are you going to police 7 billion people? You aren't. It's not possible. Similarly, our intellectual property regime is not well suited to, to use in decentralized fashion. Social media node operators being entities offering the transmission, routing, or providing of connections for digital online communications of material of the user's choosing without modification to the content of the materials as sent or received are service providers for the purposes of the Digital Millennium Copyright Act and publishers under the Copyright Act. They therefore need to consider their own exposure for hosting material, which might give rise to copyright infringement claims. Boom! Blockchain's already solving that with NFT. So sit down on your DMCA high horse. We don't need a governing body for DMCA. The users will be able to determine that based off of the records of the NFTs that they have created and the original content creator for that piece of content that's being consumed. Now, of course, there are copyright algorithms, I suppose, or there's, there's copyright software or code that needs to be written to identify this type of thing, but plenty of different NFT platforms have already started working on this. Once again, we don't have to adhere to the old guard in relation to the digital transformation that we are going through. You can think outside of the box, guys. It's also possible copyright trolls will ravage node operators in repeated bad faith attempts to extort small dollar settlements. This might result in decentralized applications that do not support images or videos, being the types of copyrightable subject matter which is most often used by vexatious copyright enforcement law firms at all. It is difficult to speculate what kind of infringements and enforcement one might encounter in a communications medium which does not yet exist. Judging from what we see in Web 2, however, the, the presence of copyright trolls in Web 3 is a virtual certainty as soon as it becomes profitable for them to be there. Look, give the original content creator back the rights. What you were running was a scheme, a scam. Most of these record companies were running scams and manipulating and taking advantage of people. Web3 will give the power back to the individual. A further issue arises when we consider that a person participating in a decentralized network may, in the course of operating his or her node, acquire large quantities of subscriber data. Node operators may be seen as providers of an electronic communication service for the purposes of of the Stored Communications Act and therefore may re be required to hand over records of their computers to the government without a warrant, at least to the extent that those records pertain to third parties that are within a node operator's possession and control. Users are unlikely to want to run a network that invites this degree of intrusion into their personal lives. Applications will need to be design, designed so that they hold as little third-party data as possible on their nodes. Once again, we kind of go back to the issue of the biggest problem within Web3, which is persistent storage, and how that is solved is going to be, of course, paramount here. All of, the, all of the issues identified above share one factor in common. Social media requires a degree of censorship and deletion, not immutable, globally shared pools of information. Yeah, in the past, not anymore. Decentralized tech like Bitcoin is designed in such a way as to render deletion impossible or prohibitively expensive. A decentralized Twitter will not, therefore, look anything like Bitcoin. Now, I do agree with that, just basically due to I don't know what 
persistent storage is going to look like. And I don't know how you get to the point. Look, you can sort of extrapolate the future and what it will sort of look like. Like we've talked about, that idea is going to be the people governing, governing themselves in relation to what is acceptable and what is not acceptable on the blockchain. The tools to do this will be created eventually. Do I have the idea or know exactly how these tools will be created and function down to the actual code base? No, I do not. But I can tell you that that is the path that we begin to take. The need for content removal and moderation, whether due to criminal liability, civil liability, or simply usability will be a sing the single most important factor in the design of a decentralized social media system. At minimum, the centrality of the content moderation to the social media user experience means that simply dumping everything on the blockchain as BitClout does, and then replicating it across every single node of the network as Sam Bankman Fried may want, with on-chain pointers to IPFS for everything else is simply not going to work. My hunch is that the first truly successful decentralized social media system will not try to be an all signing, all dancing world computer, but rather will have its users replicate the absolute bare minimum viable information required for the network to function. The blockchain piece, if any, should be regulated to the providing uh, a register of usernames and associated public keys and very little else. It will also likely limit the kind of data users host to plain text for the most part. This is a low liability proposition from the perspective of criminal copyright and data protection law. It is also much lighter on bandwidth and will be easier to transmit peer to peer. Video and image hosting simply due to the sheer quantity of data involved will likely be outsourced anyway, much as it is now. There are plenty of third-party platforms, BitChute, Cozy, Odyssey, that have lax but not non-existing content moderation policies for video content. These could address the gaps in the market currently served by establishment outfits like YouTube. And look, that is one idea. You could utilize AI, or even obviously we have the, the whole idea of use, proof of useful work and AI with Flux and Web3, there has to be a way where you can integrate that to where you could vote on the chain to say, hey, look, child porn, bam, use the AI, detect it, take it down. You don't need a governing body to enact that sort of policy. And I think that by and large, by the way, once again, by and large, a majority of the 7 billion people on the planet that would be making the decision would agree on that. What moderation exists would be up to the users. They could control what content they see by operating their own whitelist blacklist of third-party content providers. Libs could block all the right-leaning sites and cons could block all the lib media, for example. You can kind of do that already now, right within Web 2, obviously, like you are still a sovereign individual that can determine which content you wish to consume and which content you do not wish to consume. I don't think that that changes with this in particular. The decentralized system would then become just another source of referral traffic to these websites. He says, <clears throat> I could be wrong, of course. Some wonder kind somewhere could, as we speak, be writing a 6,000 word blog post on a ZK dork proof shark sharding social media proposal to be built on some all singing, all dancing Ethereum like Rube Goldberg machine. All right, dude, you're just getting a little carried away, aren't you? That will solve all scaling problems by magic. My hunch, however, is that simpler answers are more likely to be the right ones. Decentralized social media is likely to become more like RSS than Ethereum. Whilst this sketch describes an imperfect solution to the censorship debate, an imperfect solution might nonetheless be a sufficient one. Most of the politically motivated censorship that occurs on Twitter and Facebook is not of images and videos, but of links to third party websites, the plain text expression of wrong think and the digital identities themselves. And that's a good point. You could start purely by having text only and you eliminate probably you know, at least 
I mean, honestly, if it's text only, you probably eliminate 80% of the potential wrongdoing that could be done that most people would agree against. You could start there with the decentralized social media platform. It could be Twitter and back to Twitter when it was 140 characters and that's it. That's all you get. You can write that out. And then all you have to police at that point is going to be things like doxing, etc., harm on individuals. That is all you would have to really take into account and everything else would be pretty easy. And then you could essentially probably do some sort of vote on chain to auto automatically basically moderate any sort of doxing that's going on by eliminating the uses uh, use of private addresses via an AI. Easy done start there move to the more complicated stuff like video and photos later on a solution to censorship problem likely needs to ensure mainly that text links and identity are uncensorable the text and links by being self-hosted and the identity by being immutable if we frame the problem to that limited set of issues i think a usable version of decentralized twitter is achievable in the very near future and i agree i think we kind of wrapped i disagree on a few things like i said i think we can replace the old guard with a new guard i think it's going to happen inevitably no matter what what it looks like exactly you know i don't know but more on this topic we have elon wants to authenticate every twitter user crypto twitter should take notice obviously what we're talking about here is the ability to stay anonymous on social media if you so choose now from my perspective one of the great things about twitter as it stood previously was that i had the option to remain anonymous if i so wanted to as compared to facebook with its kyc of course outside of ip address information that's going to be obtained and recorded by twitter as it stands while you may be thinking oh great another newsletter gushing about elon musk mega packed by twitter that's not where i'm going here instead there's a mu there's much to unpack in the deal in terms of privacy free speech and regulations of course this assumes the deal actually goes through the narrative tesla ceo spacex founder and boring company creator elon musk has come to the terms uh, come to terms with the board of twitter to acquire the company and take it private why it matters. Twitter occupies a fairly important role in public discourse, particularly in crypto. Musk's pending takeover of the social media platform is worth watching, especially for anyone who is actually involved in crypto Twitter. Breaking it down, Elon Musk bought Twitter, almost. So the bird site basically has been largely focused on what the CEO of Tesla buying it means for free speech and bots. Something else caught my eye in the press release announcing the transaction. In a statement, Musk said, I also want to make Twitter better by, uh, than ever by authenticating all humans. Does this mean Musk wants to get rid of anonymous accounts entirely? And how would this work in practice? It seems that authenticate here would have to mean collecting some form of personal identifiable information, KYC, know your customer, right? If it's as simple as checking a box or filling out a CAPTCHA, that doesn't seem to be so bad. It's another story altogether if authentication extends to checking a license or passport or credit card to verify that there is a real human on the other end of the keyboard. The implications of Twitter, which has suffered cybersecurity breaches in the recent past collecting PII, are troubling. In particular, a large number of Twitter's users remain pseudonymous or an, uh, anonymous for various reasons, ranging from just wanting to troll or harass people to having credible fears of posting under their actual identities. As reported, as reporter Melissa Chan points out, governments interested in identifying dis dissidents or activists may try to leverage influence over Musk in ways they could not influence Twitter itself. A lot of folks may also just not have access to the, the kind of IDs that might be needed. This authentication solution would have to account for these individuals. You know, blockchain could solve that. I'm, I'm sorry. <laughs> Musk is known for disliking bots and their potential role on social media, and it would make sense for him to focus on that specific issue. Authenticating accounts is one way of addressing that. On the other hand, 
He also has said that he wants to make open, make open source the algorithms that drive Twitter. In and of itself, this won't change too much. Musk has not committed to making the data that Twitter's algorithms use to drive their decision-making pub process public. He better. He better. I just, I'm just saying. It's the only way this really works for me. And that's probably where the real digital gold lies. On the other hand, it's hard to reconcile clamp down on bots with here's the source code. Open source apps usually are easier to make bots for, says someone I know. Well, <laughs> that is true. Uh, closing the transaction. The other question I have is whether the Securities and Exchange Commission has a role here. And this brings me back to the asterisk from earlier. Musk hasn't actually bought Twitter yet. He and the Twitter board have agreed to a transaction whereby Musk will acquire Twitter and take it private. This could take up to six months, according to uh, Twitter CEO Parag Argo Argowal. Plenty could happen in that time, including Musk changing his mind, which let's face it, isn't exactly out of the realm of possibility. You see, this is the boilerplate language in the addendum to the Form 8K filed to the SEC. Quote, additional risks and uncertainties include those associated with the possibility that the conditions to closing of the transaction are not satisfied, including the risk that required approvals from Twitter stockholders for the transaction or required regulatory approvals to consummate the transaction that are not obtained. Mm. Here's it. We'll be getting into this some more, okay? Uh, the form also cites the potential for litigation and the ability of each party to consummate the transaction. In other words, if shareholders sue, or regulators, I suppose, or if it turns out Musk can't leverage his equity or whatever, the deal could be called off. However, those scenarios don't seem likely based on some informational conversations I've had so far. There's also the question of the Form 13G. I believe, by the way, what he's talking about there is if either or fails, they owe the other one $1 billion. So really, Twitter's in a position where it's already going to have earning reports dive down. And if they have those earning reports are showing low and then they have another billion dollar in expenses for not accepting and continuing through with the deal with Elon, they could have a major, major dip in their stock price, which would then, of course, open them up to loss lawsuit to the for, to lawsuit from their shareholders so that's really where it's kind of cornered there's also a question of the form 13g that musk originally filed that form is for passive investors who will take no active role in trying to influence the company musk later filed a 13d which does indicate an intent to actively influence the platform but the sec will likely have some questions about the order of events here speaking of regulators the european union wasted no time in reminding Musk of its own view on social media and digital data. Per my colleagues Jack Schnickler, Brussels was quick to warn Musk that he would be subject to the EU strictures. And the thing is, is if you're going to be promoting free speech, the U.S. is in a unique position for you as a company to allow for that on your platform. But there are other countries that are not going to be that way. What is the U.S. now, of course, already starting to work on as soon as this deal starts going through and there's a threat of freedom of speech on a social media platform? What happens right away? Disinformation board by the U.S. government. You know why? Because they want the power that other countries already have. Quote, be it on cars or social media, any company operating in Europe needs to comply with our rules, regardless of their shareholding, end quote, tweeted European Commissioner Thierry Breton. He referred to the Digital Services Act, a newly cast law that requires social media and other online platforms to account for their algorithms, take down unlawful content, and protect rights. Considering Musk has practically made it a side hustle to tweak the noses of regulators, his purchase of a high-profile media platform that will put him squarely in the the sights of those same regulators is as ironic as it promises to be entertaining past the popcorn. I also want to point this out. 
go listen to the sovereign individual. It specifically says this type of thing will start ha happening where the nation states will struggle in competition with individuals that are autonomous. This is, these are individuals that thanks to, of course, their position within society from a financial level are able to start influencing are stable are able to start making decisions and force them to actually change the way that they function. Nation states will have to start functioning at lower and lower levels. They won't be able to have wide governing bodies. It's going to be hard. This is part of the transformation. Now, it could be 10 years, 20 years, 30 years down the line, probably 70 years down the line from the beginning of this transformation if we had to wait it all the way out. But that is what will start happening according to that book, which is interesting. Now, we could say that that is tinfoil hat, sure. But I find it crazy that this is actually something that's going on. Apparently, the Federal Reserve no nominees haven't actually been voted on by the Senate yet. My bad. I thought this happened weeks ago. Votes are expected this week. So there you go. I got under the wrong one. That's the end of that article. I just like, I was like, this doesn't even make sense. So what else happened here? Saki announces the goal of the disinformation board is to stop disinformation from traveling around the country. To me, let's listen to this though. Let's just get into it. She had previously called the Hunter Biden laptop a, a Trump campaign product, um, seeming to discredit its validity or <clears throat> validity of reporting surrounding that. Um, how can, can you assuage concerns of people who are looking at this person who's been appointed to this position and wondering if she's going to be able to accurately judge misinformation now that a lot of that reporting has been uh, proven to be factual in some ways? Well, I don't have any comments on the laptop, but what I can tell you is that it sounds like the objective of the board is to prevent disinformation and misinformation from traveling around the country in a range of communities. I'm not sure who opposes that effort. Um, she had previously called the Hunter Biden. Me, I oppose that effort. I oppose. The government should not regulate speech. Now in chat, we do talk about private companies being able to regulate speech based on, you know, that specific company right now, as it stands. Sure. Idealistically, that can be a thing. You as an individual can regulate your own speech. That is the number one thing. Once again, we go back into kind of the ideas of stoicism. You can't basically change the world, but you can change how you react to the world. So at the very least, you do have the God-given right or nature-given right or whatever deity or ideology you would like to, uh, uh, you know, espouse to, you do have that right to regulate your own speech. Okay? You always have that right. All right? You always have that right. That is you. It is nobody else. So let's be clear on that. Now, I do oppose the government regulating speech, even if they want to put it under the guise of disinformation. Because at that point, who is determining what is and what is not disinformation? Let's read this article and respond to it from the New York Post going into more detail. Biden blasted for pol policing free speech with dystopian disinformation bureau. Oh, big brother. President Biden came under fire Thursday for the creation of a dystopian disinformation bureau created under its Homeland Security Department, which critics are blasting as just a way for the government to police free speech online. Conservatives slammed the Department of Homeland Security's Orwellian uh, new disinformation governance board, with some suggesting the timing is convenient given Elon Musk vowed to make Twitter a free speech haven after his $44 billion takeover of the social media platform notorious for selectively censoring right-leaning points of view. Missouri Senator Josh Howley called the new board a disgrace that was designed to monitor all American speech. In a letter to Homeland Security, Alejandro Mayorkas and Holly said he initially thought Wednesday's announcement was satire. 
Surely no American administration would ever use the power of the government to sit in judgment on the First Amendment speech of its own citizens. Sadly, I was mistaken, Hawley wrote. Quote, rather than protecting our border or the American homeland, you have chosen to make policing American speech your priority, end quote. Florida Republican con congressional candidate Dr. Willie Montag tweeted, quote, is there anything more dystopian than a disinformation governance board run by the federal government? And Texas GOP Congressman Troy Nels griped, quote, they didn't need a disinformation governance board until Elon Musk threatened their control over the narrative. There must have been tinfoil hat, and maybe this channel gets taken down at this point. Tinfoil hat, be clear, we don't have any proof of this. But maybe the federal government did have specific, some sort of specific ways to regulate speech on Twitter. And that is what's getting removed from the code now. That is what is happening in behind the scenes. That's why they need more time. That's what is going on here. And they also need more time to figure out how they're going to regulate the speech. Tinfoil hat. But dear Lord. Republican Congresswoman Lauren Boebert accused Democrats of spending, quote, the last week's planting the seeds for the backup plan in case the Twitter deal actually happened, end quote. She too called the news dystopian and said the left can't afford to let the truth be anything but what they say. The hashtag Ministry of Truth was also trending on Twitter as critics compared the new board to George Orwell's 1984 novel. Quote, Adolf Hitler had a ministry of truth. Joseph Goebbels had a ministry of truth. Joseph Stalin had a ministry of truth. Joseph Biden has a ministry of truth, tweeted Errol Weber, GOP congressional candidate in California. Georgia representative Andrew Clyde added, quote, Biden's dystopian disinformation governance board is seriously dangerous and wholly unconstitutional. I'm demanding Congress investigate DHS Ministry of Truth now. The newly formed panel will target supposed misinformation aimed at key points of vulnerability for Biden and Democrats, such as southern border migrants, as well as monitor and prepare for Russian disinformation threats as this year's midterm elections near the DHS said. Quote, the spread of disinformation can affect border security, American safety during disasters, and public trust in our democratic institutions, the department said in a statement. DHS said that the board will, quote, protect privacy, civil rights, and civil liberties, end quote, as part of its duties. Um, no, you won't. No, you won't. We know you won't. This is extremely frustrating. I'm going to take us all the way back, though. The only way out of this is self-governance. The only way out of this is to complete the transformation to the digital age, specifically utilizing blockchain to allow the public to have a better way out. It's the only way that we get out of this at this point I, that I can see. There will be minor steps that will be taken by influential people like Musk. There will be that sort of thing that happens for quite some time. But this is not okay at the end of the day. And the thing is, is we could get into it politically. I am completely disappointed that there is not one single Democrat that I have seen against this. Where are you guys at? I'm, where are you at? Come out against it. Aren't you the party of free speech? Let's talk about Ethereum if you want to get more angry. <laughs> Ethereum's going greener, guys. We have the merge. The dev call is going on right now. I'll check at the end of this show to see if we have any sort of information on the delay of the merge just to catch up to it. Maybe one of y'all already has it. <clears throat> what is the Ethereum merge and how could it make crypto greener? 
Ethereum is preparing for an upgrade that's been described as, quote, the single most important event in crypto history, end quote. And I do agree with that. It will be the single most important because depending on how well it functions, if it's successful at all, and what happens, it will determine some turning point within the crypto industry. That will be true. The transition would overhaul the infrastructure of the world's second largest blockchain. Analysts predict the changes could cut the network's energy costs by 99% and push the price of Ether, uh, but the plans have been beset by delays. Here's everything you need to know about the long-awaited merge. What is it? The merge aims to make the Ethereum blockchain more efficient by switching from proof-of-work mechanism to a proof-of-stake system. Proof-of-work, which was pioneered by Bitcoin, is secured by crypto miners solving complex but pointless mathematical puzzles, a process that consumes a vast amount of energy. A proof-of-stake system, meanwhile, is maintained by users staking crypto to process transactions. This is a heavily biased article, by the way, uh, so far. Ethereum currently runs both mechanisms. The merge will, I could rewrite this system, I could rewrite this sentence in a different manner. They would put it more on par with the favoritism they show towards it when they say something like adding pointless mathematical puzzles because proof of work is not pointless. Proof of work is what is basically adding value to the currency and adding a process that consumes a vast amount of energy. I could also go into proof of stake and say that it is powered by pointless mathematical puzzles based on the amount of money you have staked into the currency and wastes a ton of energy due to the amount of backup systems and data centers waiting for the virtual machine to fail over. Ethereum currently runs both mechanisms. The merge will combine the two layers into a single proof of stake based chain. Not really how this is going to work, by the way. You have your consensus layer and you have your uh, execution layer. They need to move the execution layer, which is currently proof of work over and join it, sort of join it, uh, but it will still run as separate chains within the system, right? You basically have two different layers there. All the Ether cryptocurrency on the network will be unaffected by the switch. What are the pros and cons of the merge? Proof of stake proponents expect the merge to make Ethereum more scalable, secure, and sustainable. The switch would make blockchain miners obsolete and slash the emissions of the numerous projects, including many NFT platforms that run on the Ethereum infrastructure. Carl, a researcher at the Ethereum Foundation, estimates that the transaction or transition, excuse me, will reduce the network's energy consumption by 99.95%. That could also convince more people to invest in Ethereum. However, not everyone is convinced of the benefits. Critics have raised concerns about the security risks and doubts about the impact on Ethereum scalability. It would be amiss to also point out that essentially they do not have a withdrawal function from staking really uh, right now post-merge. That will come later. So you won't be able to get your staked ETH out as far as I understand right now. Um, yeah, perhaps the biggest issue is the merge merges endless post postponements. When is the merge happening? The merge was first proposed in 2016, but the transition has proven more complex than expected. In March, Ethereum founder Vitalik Buterin defended delay, saying switching to a simpler proof of stake in 2017 or even 2020 could have led to much less environmental damage and a lot more research uh, and anti-crypto men mentality as a result of environmental damage and a lot more research talent being free to think about scaling. Here's the other thing though, it is a simpler version than what was originally announced because what was originally announced was basically going to be something called ETH 2.0. It was going to be able to merge the actual chains. You wouldn't have a separate execution chain and a separate consensus layer and you would have multiple shards. All of the stuff, all of the stuff that was more difficult is still delayed indefinitely. The only thing happening is the consensus mechanism change, really, at this point. 
He added that the switch would finally happen very soon. Researchers expected this to happen in June, but insiders this month warned of further delays. Tim Biko, by the way, we already covered this. Ethereum Foundation developer Tim Biko tweeted April 12th that the merge won't be in June, but likely in a few months after. Quote, there's a lot of skepticism because Ethereum has promised proof of stake for five years, he said. It's hard to convince people that it, this time it's for real. Nonetheless, he promised that the merge was nearing the end of its final chapter. Supporters of Ethereum will hope that he's correct because the network's competition is heating up. Let's get into it. So, um, what I need to know is, well, we'll look at the end of this. Let's get into profitability. Here's what we have today is, today is the day that they are supposed to give us some more information on when the merge is going to actually happen. It'll be covered on this channel later today, hopefully by 6 p.m. this evening. That is my goal time. I do have a lot of errands to run first. It may be even later, but that is the video we're going to be posting later today. So make sure you hit the like, subscribe, and notification bell so you're notified and the YouTube algorithm knows that you want to see that video. Let's talk about mining profitability. We are still mining Ethereum. And we are at 199 US dollars today at 0 0.069 ETH, uh, at least expected earnings for the day. Uh, I believe, can we see previous payouts? Um, not necessarily. Okay, yeah, right here uh, was 0 0.063, so quite a bit lower, but we, we just started mining on there. Um, not really any dissimilar from two miners. I also wanted to point out that we do have a worker from Specs over here that is donating some hash rates. So I, I much appreciate it, Specs. Shout out to you. Um, thanks for donating the 60 mega, 68 mega hash a second, uh, or basically an average of 60 mega hash a second. So either it's a, what, a 3070 or an RX 6800 or an RX 6800 XT, or it's a light hash rate GPU. I'm trying to think, maybe a 3070 Ti, are those up to 60 mega hash a second yet? Let's talk about profitability on the RTX 3090 as always as well, via what to mine, correcting the Zell hash hash rate. Ethereum's at $3.58 a day after 10 cents a kilowatt hour power. Ryo is at $3.45 a day after power. Huh? What? What? Que pasa? In things I did not see coming today, there's been an over 20% increase in price of Ryo currency, making it competitive to mine right now, provided you guys don't go all immediately, immediately after this and start mining it. Oh, sorry. It's a 37% increase. It just went to six cents. Sorry, it's a 37% increase in Ryo currency. What is going on with Ryo today? I don't know. Let me go ahead and see if I can find out what's happening here. What is happening? All right, I've been following Ryo for a while. It still only has 2,043 followers. F Fierce UK, we got to talk, bro. What is happening? There was a tweet on April 17th saying, 
It will be listed on Dapsy. Users can follow Rio and at Rio and add it to their profile. Dapsy.io is an anonymous crypto social network looking to gather all crypto communities together. Oh my God. It's all coming together, boy. It's all coming together. Dapsy. Dapsy IO, the crypto social network for crypto investors. Listed on, of course, all the good ones. And now Rio is listed on Dapsy. Is that what's happening? It sure feels like that might be what's happening. Now, Rio is a privacy coin that's been around since the last bull run. Originally, it was Sumo coin. It was then forked by Fierce UK when the original developers of Rio were basically rug pulling it. And then it turned into Rio currency. And that is where we have sat at. I used to run the largest Rio mining pool uh, in existence for about a year and uh, I didn't see this coming. It doesn't even feel like I want to cover the rest of profitability, but we will do it just for fun. We have Zell Hash on Nice Hash at $2.44 a day after power, beating it out, mining it directly, which is at $2.23 a day after power. You have Cero at $2.28 a day after power and Conflux at $2.26 a day after power. Nice hash for Octopus is at $1.99 a day after power, so you're better off mining it directly. Z Classic is at $2.01 a day after power. We covered a little bit about Z Cash yesterday. And then Bitcoin Z is pumping up as well which is another one that is old. What is happening to Bitcoin Z? Let's go ahead and take a look. It's down. Something is probably a little weird with that. Oops. Deal. Bitcoin Gold. Ravencoin on Kapow, $1.76 a day after power. And Ergo at $1.86 a day after power. Flux still around two while well, down from 1.9 mega solutions a second to 1.89 mega solutions a second. Let's check Bitcoin. We know that Bitcoin's been having a difficulty increase recently. It's still sitting around 230 exahash a second. It looks like the difficulty has been realized. Let's take a look at Ethereum. Ethereum is at 1.05 petahash a second so down a little bit ethereum classic down still to 25.87 terahash a second since, since the fifth inning raven coin at 3.2 terahash a second let's look at ryo now out of curiosity there is a sharp increase that it just happened around 9 a.m. to 1 mega hash a second. It's been bouncing. Its last high was at 1.34 mega hash a second on Tuesday, April 26th. Mining pool profitability for the past 90 days. Flex pool in first, mining pool up in second, F2 pool in third. Last 60 days, F2 pool in first, F flex pool in second. Mining pool hub in third. Last 30 days, crazy pool in first. F2 pool in second. Flex pool in third. Last 21 days, crazy pool still on top with F2 pool in second and hive on in third. For the last 14 days, crazy pool in first. F2 pool in second. Hive on in third. For the last seven days, crazy pool in first. F2 pool in second. Hive on in third. For the last three days, mining pool hub in first. Crazy pool in second. F2 pool in third. And for the last day, ZET in first. Crazy pool in second and F2 pool in third. I'm gonna ask everybody to go ahead and hit that like button one more time. And then I also wanted to show you guys something here. Because this is the
most important thing, in my opinion, right now, that you should probably take into account. Let me make sure on the Chrome Web Store. We'll make sure I get the right one. So in the wake of this information, campaigns, that sort of stuff, how can you protect yourself and get a, a just another better idea of what is really happening? Because all of these social media companies that are starting to participate in this sort of censorship, what is the first thing they do? They remove the analytics that give you an idea of if the public agrees with or does not agree with something. What we have here is a way for you to return the YouTube dislike count uh, through the, a plugin on Chrome. So it's free. You can add it. It will add the dislike count back. I encourage you to do it. You can test it on my channel if you want, but please hit the like button if you find the content helpful and useful. That is the point of a like and dislike count. If I say something that is not accurate, if somebody on YouTube says something that's not accurate, a user can tell by the ratio of likes to dislikes and then they'll be able to inform themselves to by scrolling down to the comment section and checking out what the issue was or where it sat. Now, I will make mistakes because I do frequently and I like you guys to keep me accountable and I try to do my best to not make mistakes. Also, part of the thing is we do this live news show kind of at this point, which has changed things up a lot. I appreciate all of the constructive criticism. I am constantly trying to improve and that is my commitment to you guys, but you should have the ability to determine like to dislike ratio. You should have the ability to determine if that content is valid or invalid. Part of the reason that this happened is because a lot of the mass media news sites that are following a specific agenda on YouTube were getting ratioed to heck. Another way to determine ratios too on Twitter that you should pay attention to is the amount of replies or retweets compared to the amount of favorites. That is a good idea of how you can basically follow the ratios to determine and help you determine truth. That is what I want you to be able to do because at this point we do not need to follow what the ministry of truth tells us is truth because uh, as opposed to its name, and what we're using now is disinformation instead of truth. Instead, as its name would imply, it is the antithesis of that. <sighs> ASIC mining profitability. Jazzminer X4 server, $98.27. Gold Shell KD6 down to $72. If we scroll down a little bit further, we have the Antminer L7 still sitting above $40 a day. And then the big one, of course, is going to be the S19 Pro, still only around $12 a day through mining rig rentals. Digibyte, about $11.51 a day if you mine Digibyte directly. I'm assuming Bitcoin is a much worse right now with the re recent increase in difficulty and drop in price. But once again, it's inevitable. Bitcoin's ine inevitable. And I think as we talked about yesterday, these mining companies are willing to take debt out betting on Bitcoin. Le Trojan horse, my friends. Any miners on sale? Not really. There is, though. The new What's Miner M30S++. It's 104 to 110 tera hash, comes with the power supply is, and is 9,160 US dollars. Unfortunately, I'm super excited for the new What's Miner M30S++ because that's more competition in the market and it's hitting those S19 Pro numbers, albeit in, somewhere in between there. That being said, the pricing is still, you know, 
what are you going to buy here too? Are you going to buy a what's miner that does 104 to 110 terahash a second? Or are you going to buy an S19 Pro that does 110 uh, terahash a second for a couple hundred dollars less? Right? I guess we could look at power, which would be important. So on the S19 Pro, um, the power efficiency at the wall... Well, let's just say power at the wall is 3250. That's an easy one to see. On the what's minor, 110 terahash, which is 9,670 US dollars. So actually about seven, almost $700 more than that. We are at 3,472. Just based on the stats off the page, you would be better off right now buying an S19 Pro. Just saying. But I am excited for the new what's minors. They're cool. Um, the 104 terahash is the 9,160, 106 is 9,333, and the 108 is 9,501. So, let's get into questions and answers for the day. We have about 10 minutes or so for that. Remember, super chats are never required, always appreciated in the first to be answered. After that, tagging at son of a tech will highlight my name orange and make it easier for me to read. So there you go. I can't catch up on the super chats from earlier. I apologize for that. Let me see if I can actually pull it up on stream elements right now for you guys. I'll have to get logged in though. Bam, 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 bam. Oh. Does it have, I think because I wasn't logged into it, it's not going to give it to me. Activity feed. No stream activity. Are we on the YouTube one? We are. So, unfortunately, I don't have those pulled up. I apologize. Tag me again. I wish there was a better way to figure that out. I wish they would show it to you. But um, let's get into questions and answers. Panzer says, at Simon Tech, congratulations for 500 live concurrent viewers. We broke it today. Thank you guys for the support. That was awesome. I think we ended up at 501 concurrent viewers for the peak. That is amazing. It's all good mining, says that son of a tech. Party, you've topped 500 watching now. Yes, guys, I get it. We did it. We dropped back down, but that is okay. We're nearing the end of the show. Blacksmith Mining Company says that son of a tech. Did you, uh, did you, uh, ETH Dev was sent, did I, I think you mean, did I see an ETH Dev was sentenced to jail for breaking sanctions with North Korea two weeks ago? His name is Vigil Griffith. No, I did not see that. Thanks for letting me know. I'll try to look that up. Real Rigo says, "Ask Simon Tech, if you think about going from one giga hash to five plus giga hash, what did you do that had the biggest impact to get you to five giga hash? Um, 220. More power. Andy Simpson says, at Simon Tech, what wallets do you use? Any wallet that serves the purpose that I need at any given time. I have a mix of very cold wallets, which are offline generated Bitcoin wallets. They have never touched online. I have what I would call like, you know, warm wallets, like your hardware wallets, Trezors, uh, BC vaults, the stones, all of those warm wallets then i have completely hot hot wallets metamask um yo roi tons of depending on what i'm trying to interact with right um it all depends on what i'm trying to do but i utilize a lot of them there's not any one that's best or anything like that Obviously, you have some integrations that can help, like MetaMask integrations with a warm wallet such as a Ledger, some stuff like that, where you could basically kind of make your MetaMask a little bit more warm, a little more cozy, a little less hot, hot heat, you know, that sort of thing. 
Jim's Innovations $2 Super Chat says, what you think about ETC block reward drop? It has damaged the network pretty significantly as far as profitability. Trading Nickel says at Son of a Tech EIP 3354 pushes the difficulty bomb to June 2022 or to or something 2022. EIP 3354. We got it. Is that the name of it? Let's go ahead and get this in going. This is going to be the most important thing. If we can find it. No, because this 30. Okay, 3554 was the delay to 2021 or December of 2021. I'm trying to see which one you're talking about. Let's go through all of this real quick. All. Oh, man, there's too many of them. Let me go to the all core devs call. Uh, Ethereum Foundation. Let's go take a look. The All Core Devs meeting was streamed 24 minutes ago and it is done. Let's look at the issues here that they discussed. Right? That's what we want to see. Uh, the agenda here. All right. So. Merge updates, post merge updates. Hmm, I may need help from chat here because I'm not seeing a, a specific listing. EIP 30, It'll be Shanghai, right? Here we go. Uh, op codes, limit near, push instructions, warm code base, save historical block, pre-compile, transient storage, gosh, gas changes, EIP 4907. So it's not listed in the Shanghai update either. Josu saying EIP 4907. Yeah, because June was already the other one. Um, I'm aware base calculation fee. I'm not seeing 40 f f that one either. Forty three forty five was the delay to twenty twenty two or June of twenty twenty two. Here's some drafts. What's forty three? Oops. Okay, so let's see. 
From what I could tell, they didn't actually make a decision on bomb delay. They're going to have to wait another two weeks. I am hearing, okay, so chat is saying that they have basically delayed their announcement of a delay. Which is hilarious. The newest one that I saw Yeah, the only thing regarding difficulty is for the move to proof of stake. Can't be the delay of the announcement of the delay now, can you? That is so Ethereum. <laughs> That's Ethereum if I've ever heard of Ethereum. Hot Crypto Mining, thanks for the 499 Super Chat says, congrats on the 500. I actually saw 508. What do you think of Octo Miners? I'm currently converting my farm to all Octo Miners. Seems easier to manage. Octo Miners can be great. Some of the issues can be if you have like the firmware gets shipped with the original firmware, you need to update it because it'll cause some reboot errors. In addition to that, over the year that I've ran it, I have had one 140 millimeter fan die on me in there. And they're not very fun to replace, but that's pretty much the only downsides to them other than of course price, which can be expensive. Other than that, I think that they offer a, a much better solution in larger farm configurations than uh, open air, at least in my uh, experience here. All right. Uh, Lord Beerus says, "Ask some of the, How do you feel about Hive on Pool? I was about thinking about switching uh, to the free Hive OS. Um, Hive on Pool. Obviously, you need to watch out and determine your hash rate between utilizing it for the three percent pool fee or the three dollars per rig. We were discussing that at the beginning of the show." Um, in addition to that, right now it's had pretty good steady payouts recently, uh, which is nice thanks to its PPS plus versus PPLNS from other uh, pools. Scott Schultz says, as I'm a tech sailor's proposal would work great for stopping bots, in my opinion. Do you not agree with them? What's the problem do you see? I saw it. Um, I didn't like, I understand the proposal, but at the end of the day, you're still making people pay. The good news would be, of course, that you could do it anonymously. John uh, John 2.0 says, at Son of a Tech, do you swing trade too? I don't trade. Boy Matthew says, at Son of a Tech, your rig's doing okay nowadays. They're hot. It is what it is. Hopefully we'll move soon. Sean says, at Son of a Tech, is the 1660 Super a good card to populate your first rig with? Good budget card. The best budget card, my friend. Definitely a good one to go with, especially if you get uh, memory modules that are passively cooled. You're not going to have as many issues there. And they're just tanks. They're the most reliable I got in my farm for sure. General Granger, Granger, there we go, says, As I'm a tech, is Al uh, Alephium worth dual mining with some more power with ETH? It depends on your setup. As we get into the summer months, I'd probably lean towards, in most cases, no. Um, we also have to talk about pretty much anything that is going to be, uh, Alephium is going to be utilizing the core pretty heavily. Um, and you have more chances of degradation of the GPU core when you are mining on it, especially in hotter environments. So that's why. PXL Nona says, as son of a tech, buy two used 1660 Supers at 250 each or one new A2000 for 550. I would buy the 1660 Supers personally. Tomex says, as son of a tech, uh, stores are stocked with GPUs. Which ones are you most like excited to buy? The most excited to buy? I'm, I mean, I, I want to get the new Intels when they launch. But um, as far as being excited, and the new, um, of course, AMD revisions, the 6650 XT is probably the most exciting one. But 
in stock. Um, when I'm seeing the 1660 Supers at 200 to 250, I'm getting pretty excited about those. Joe Sue says, ask time attack. Okay, those are all the EIPs. We couldn't really figure it out. Um, Blacksmith Mining says, ask time attack. They delayed their decision till May, basically until block times near 21 seconds. They don't care. That makes sense. Uh, Academy says, as time attack, decentralized Twitter could just copy the picture AI from Twitter uh, and become when it becomes open source. No, uh, because you would still have to integrate basically the blockchain. Um, just having like a just having the code that is built for you know Web 2.0 isn't going to translate into Web 3.0. Detroit Iris says, as I'm a tech, if they're delaying the announcement of the delay, it sounds like they're trying to cram code together just so they don't have to delay again, no matter the outcome. It would be interesting if they force this through, right? Michael crew, uh, Michael, I'm just going to say Michael, dude. It says, as I'm a tech, devs couldn't uh, decide what to do. Ultimately, they want to do the merge before the block time would exceed 18 seconds. So in theory, the bomb wouldn't be needed. Um, at son of a tech, Michael says some other dev wanted to do a diff bomb delay just so they wouldn't have to worry about it. They should decide around the third or fourth week of May. Holy moly. So in May, we start getting uh, artificial difficulty increases. You need to pay attention to that because that's going to increase some problems, boys. Uh, re to the link, which says at son of a tech has the bomb already gone off. Or is it starting to escalate June time? Uh, May is when it's supposed to go off. So it should go off on Sunday. I would prepare for, you know, next week to start seeing hits to profitability of Ethereum for sure. Tanner Cal Caldwell says, Ask Simon Tech, have you checked out the upcoming iPolo mini Ethereum Classic Miner? Uh, oh, with a new one, the 300 mega hash a second at 200 watts. No, I have not. That one's really interesting. I don't know where I could pick it up though. Martin says, ask time of tech, minor status, pro, uh, minor stat OS profit switch versus Hive on or Hive OS nice hash. Which one and why? Um, you know, I haven't looked into the minor stat one as much. I wouldn't utilize uh, nice hash just because I'm not a fan of it. I believe. If I recall, the minor stat OS profit switching still gives you control over the, does it still give you control over it? Hold on. Which I need to actually do, I need to install the OS. That's the only OS I haven't done yet, to be honest. <clears throat> um, I'll have to look into it for you. I'd lean towards if it's paying you out the coins, then go that route. But I also, profit switching, you want to be very careful on because of the way the pool protocols will punish you for not being loyal to the pool. Um, but I've heard that minor stat OS kind of fixes that. And also, I mean, nice hash isn't going to have that problem. Uh, Tanner Caldwell says, "As time attack, BT miners, all iPolo mini, four thousand dollar price point. Okay, oof, that's high, isn't it? Did BT miners release that as well today? I only see the hundred and thirty mega hash still." I don't see, oh, there it is. Okay, 4,300, this will work on Ethereum. Actual average hash rate can reach 320 mega hash a second and you got six, gig of, six gigs of RAM. All right, $4,000 though. I mean, in theory, 
So this is the problem. You're stuck on Ethereum and Ethereum Classic, right? That's the obvious problem with this ASIC or an ET hash based coin. That being said, if we're looking at pricing, it's not way off, I suppose, if we compare it to like a 3090 that's sitting close to around 2000 a piece and that's gonna do a hundred and, you know, at best 120 mega hash a second, probably won't maintain that because of the heating issue. So that's 240 mega hash a second. But these prices do feel pretty rough. They also are, or do support 110, which is nice. So that's good. Patrick Gian, thanks for the $5 super chat, says, considering to sell my 580 and 6600 rig and replace with 1660 super. Thoughts? Mm, I'd get rid of, yeah, I mean, depending on how much you could sell, if you can sell your Polaris GPUs, like I'm being honest, like straight up, I have like, six of them just sitting there not mining which i need to do something with but i would if you can get rid of your polaris gpus i'd get rid of my polaris gpus 6600 maybe not so much but not financial advice um Scott Schultz says, ask some tech, if you're not paying for the product, then you are the product. Maybe Twitter should be a paid product. Just saying. Okay. I, I hear the argument. Andrew C says, ask some tech, what do you want to have? Uh, what, uh, why do you want to not have a government? It seems like a lot more crazy without rules in place. Rules will be established on the chain, bro. I mean, ultimately what we're talking about is the digital transformation. We're talking about smaller government. We're talking about not no government. We're talking about not as government is formed right now, currently. It's not really any different than what the United States initially did. And once you reduce that government, you reduce the burden on your citizens, the society can excel. As governments get bloated and larger, inevitably, that society crashes. This is proven out, especially through transformations when we're talking about going from hunter gatherers to agriculture and then from agriculture to industrial. But you can see it in the fall of the Roman empire. What happened with the Roman empire ultimately at the end of the day was that they were such a large burden on the peasants that were farming that the peasants began abandoning their farms because they couldn't afford the taxes. And the reason the government needed more taxes is because the managerial class has no skills to contribute to society. So they take it from the people that have skills. And what happens when you take the production of the skills away from the skilled worker and give it to the managerial class, you crash the economy and you crash the society. This has happened multiple times. The only way to prevent that is to reduce the size of government and allow the individual to provide for themselves. And in turn, they will contribute to the economy. The, the transformation into the digital age will mark basically another transformation, right? Another, another uh, period of time, sorry, excuse me, that will be similar to these transitions we've seen from different ages. And the reasoning for that is because the digital age is enabling the individual to take control over the knowledge, right? That's where we've already started. We've started to already decentralize knowledge. Everybody has a phone. Everybody can learn skills. Everybody can start working towards that. We don't have a need for a managerial class as we used to, because now we are getting tools to operate within our own governance, thanks to the blockchain. We are able to do these things. Now, that time period, like I said, the, the, the longest estimates I'm seeing is like 70 years, right? But I think it is inevitable, ultimately. That is why. Hopefully that is articulated to the best point or to the best manner and kind of adds that nuance to it a little bit. So you understand, uh, crypto Rass says, as son of a tech, you think crypto cities would be a hedge against big government. You think these cities would actually be realized. So that's a good, that's a good question because what you're going to see, like I said, is, is smaller governments. 
Um, if you read like the sovereign individual and their predictions surrounding that, once again, these are predictions. These are not things that are going to happen for sure. They could happen in any sort of manner, but you're going to see like a, dis you know, basically the nation state kind of dissolving. You'll see essentially smaller communities that decide to govern themselves within specific areas. And this is just due to the fact that it's too hard to manage 7 billion people, right? That's kind of what the idea is at the end of the day. And because of the access to, you know, computers and, and blockchain, et cetera, you're going to be able to transact with each other in areas that are very difficult to regulate at a large scale and a lot more easy to manage at a smaller scale, right? And people will be able to decide which, you know, communities they want to participate in, whether that's by a state level and then down to a city level. And the more rules that come into place, come into place at smaller and smaller levels. Just like the United States kind of initially was set up where you have like the federal government that oversees kind of in totality with a few major guiding principles down to the states, which have maybe a few more resource based things. And then you get down to the city, which is going to manage your individual interactions with one another. You get your city police, fire, whatever else. And then you'll be able to fund all of these things uh, as you see fit, right? Maybe at some point you have smart contracts that say, I want to support, you know, with my tax dollars or whatever, or my portion of the pie to contribute to society. I want to support fire, fire stations, or I want to support police, or I want to support medical. You can start getting a lot more granular. People will have more control. And because of transparency of blockchain, you'll be able to see what that there will be transparency to the policies specifically economically that the government is putting into place and it'll be better eventually. Read to the link, which says, Ask Simon Tech just finished a rig uh, for the MSI Gaming X 1660 Supers, all with Hynix, yet none of them have the negative 1004 memory uh, mem issue. 1200C, 2800 mem gets me 32.17 megahash a second. I did hear the new Hynix is doing that. Air to the Ron says, $20. Thank you for the super chat. Says, great breakdown. Hopefully you can clip that. This is the most unique daily show. Much appreciated. Glad you enjoy it. Stank says, nobody manages 7 billion people now. That's exactly the point, though. So when we get into it, nobody has been able to do that. That's why whenever people get the tinfoil hat of, like, chipping the entire population, I'm like, they can chip the entire population. They can't enforce rules on the entire population, right? The reason why we'll see this transformation due to within blockchain is because they can't enforce 7 billion people to have regulations surrounding Bitcoin. Sure, sure, and blockchain. Sure, they can put the rules in place, but they can't enforce it. That's the entire reason why the transformation will happen, whether they like it or not. Whether the people in charge like it or not, it will happen because they can't enforce it. That's the, the entire point of why it will happen, right? <clears throat> Talon says, Ask Simon Tech, I was just going to say you're talking about robust, limited government that's taking care of people's needs instead of bloatware that come preloaded into modern governments. Correct. It will be a portion of the transformation. There will be a lot of people. Look, it I, from what I've read and listened to, it, it with the transformation and everything coming to fruition, it's going to be a struggle first. Right. Just like every other time you have the dark ages after the collapse of the agricultural greatness of the Roman Empire, you will have struggles. And I think everybody will have struggles. I think we're starting to see that happen now. Right. Like if you want to just close your eyes and be blind and say the old system works and it's working fine and it, everything's going to be OK and I'll just continue on with my day job and do it. That's not what's happening. So open your eyes because that's not what's happening at this point. That's just fact. Like what we are seeing is directly related to the transformation we're going through directly due to the advances in technology that we've had. And it will continue. 
Stank Banana says, as I'm a tech, they can't ship the entire world population. That's what I was saying. I was specifically saying, even if they did though, they wouldn't be able to enforce it. You seem to be able to like only take out what you want to hear and not hear everything within context, my friend. Mario says, as son of a tech, like, love the content, Blind Run. I keep an open mind with you. Thanks everybody for watching today. I'm headed to jujitsu. Make sure that you take everything in context and try to be honest with yourself when interpreting information. I have also given you the tools to see like and dislike ratios and continue on with this course in the comment section later. Please hit the like, comment, subscribe, and notification bell to let the YouTube algorithm know that you're interested. We'll do a sum up, of course, of the Ethereum funness that's going on tonight. It sounds like it was delayed, so they delayed the delay. Yay. I'll see you next Tuesday.